All right. So happy Sabbath, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Um, I hope the week was good for everyone. Um, you know, I hope the week was good for everybody. And that despite whatever challenges presented themselves, we got an opportunity to draw closer to God. Really hope that <clears throat> tonight that the Lord will Yes. I I can concur, Marsha. Mine was also rough <laughs> and also busy. But thank God we have come to a area of rest in the week, you know. But if if it was just a continuous round of pressure and work and all those things, I don't know how I would survive, you know. So before I go any further, I just like to invite the Lord's leading. Let us pray. All right, just Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for your loving kindness and your tender mercies. Lord, we pray, God, that you blot out our sins and help us, God, to draw closer to you. We ask, Lord, that you will be our shield and our buckler. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Lord, please also provide the answers for our questions as you have faithfully done in every other week. Lord, we are dependent on you. You will promise that the Holy Spirit will guide us into our truth in the 16th chapter of John. And we come claiming that promise tonight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, so our question and answer session. Um, <laughs> our question and answer session is officially open. Well, Thursday night is actually preparation day, you know, because even a morning makes a day. So preparation day for me actually begins Thursday. And, and biblically, it begins Thursday, you know. Um, so preparation day really begins Thursday night. Um, so anyone can feel free to break the ice and pose a Bible question for this week. Good night, everyone. Night, night, Auntie Marsha. How are you doing, man? I'm all right. Um, so it's not really a biblical question, but it is something I was thinking about in the week, and I, I said I would ask your opinion or take on it. Okay. Um, so, you know, I have some friends who are... Well, we grew up in a church together, but now they're not so, um, I don't even know how to phrase it. They don't go to church anymore. And on occasions when we meet up or if we do go out, you know, like for a birthday or whatever, I noticed that um, they have stepped away from a lot of the Adventist practices. So I will see them ordering like shrimp or pork or, you know, those things that, you know, <laughs> when you sit there and you look, it, it's just like my eyes are just wide open, like, hmm, what's going on here? So even though, you know, sometimes you will see your friends or somebody stop going to church, but when you see other behaviors it really kind of you know shocking mm -hmm. so i was thinking to myself like what is the extent of the burden on me to to say something like should i and if i should what should i say do i encourage or do i ask what is going on or do i just leave it alone and Pray for them. You um, know, we don't like just 
putting them on the spot or even saying something privately. Because I think for one of them, I, I, I tried opening up a conversation, you know, like trying different ways to invite her to come to church, you know, but the, 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 the conversation just ended almost immediately. She said she and God talk and she and me started out, so... <laughs> What do you do? Because, you know, these people are my friends. There's a burden on my heart for them. You know, but I'm just wondering, like, really and truly, how do you reach, you know, that can, that set of people? Not strangers to the gospel, but people who you think. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, you know, the, 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 um, I can I can honestly relate to what you're going through. Um been in, in, in your shoes several times. Actually, I'm currently in your shoes, you know, because one of my very good friends, um, he actually grew up seven day Adventist. And currently he's not in, in the church anymore. Um you know, and you know very good friends still you know so it rests as a very serious concern for me mm -hmm. um you know because when you have friends and so on and if you're a genuine friend you really want all the good that you want for yourself you want for these friends you know um uh, and we are cognizant that there is a god and 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 if there is a god there is also a judgment you know Mm -hmm. And we, we see all the, the, the signs fast fulfilling. You know, I want to share a text. I see Sister Michelle's hands as well, and I'm going to take it. I want to share a text, but I also want to provide additional context after sharing it. Um, in, in Ezekiel, the third chapter, Ezekiel chapter three, and beginning at verse 17, it says, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. So God says that he set Ezekiel as a watchman over the house of his Israel. And he said that Ezekiel should give Israel a warning. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speak it to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn from the wickedness from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. You know, God is telling Ezekiel that he gave him a responsibility to warn his fellow israelites you know the thing is there is no universal approach to in terms of the time when 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 we have when, when we can when we can share with our loved ones i would just wanted to set forth that principle that you know god actually requires at some point that we reach out to those who are a part of his household but are straying from, from the principles set forth, you know. But also, the fundamental thing is that we have to be guided by the Spirit of God. We have to prayerfully ask God for the opportunity to have these discussions so we don't take things unto ourselves, you know, because when we go in our own strength and wisdom, sometimes we create more problems than good. But... I believe if we sincerely ask God, he will open an opportunity and he will also impress our words. I remember years ago, um, I was at my mother's house and uh, um, like childhood friends that I grew up with, they were never Adventists, but um, I, I became a Christian and they were still out there in the world, as we would say. And... We were just there talking, come and talk, you know, and it started to get frivolous and, you know, joking around and and then my conscience started to bother me because I'm saying, you know, these young men don't know anything about the kingdom and 
they are currently lost. And here am I having fun with, with them in a state where they are lost. I, you know, in my heart, I actually said a prayer sincerely. And I said, God, you know, I grew up with these guys. And right now I'm just here idle jesting and laughing with them. And they really are outside of your kingdom. And if they should die, they would be lost. I'm asking you to create an opportunity for me to witness to them. You know, immediately as I said that prayer, um, one of them, his name is Randy. Randy made a comment. He said, how is it that Saturday is the true Sabbath, but the entire world observes Sunday? Most people go to church on Sunday. How was the shift made from Saturday to Sunday? And it ended up in an all-evening Bible study, going all the way up into the night. And then another friend of my sister came by, um, Esa. And Esa shared that he had a dream that there were three stars moving around the earth and then the stars started to move faster and faster and faster and then they exploded and then tiny stars were descending and they formed the number 666 and he asked me what does the dream mean because the lord impressed him he said that i would have the answer and i went to revelation chapter 1 and verse 7 and showed him that stars represent angels and if it's three stars you saw three angels and i started to explain the relationship of the three angels message to the mark of the beast and that the study just went all up into the night so the point i was making is that i sincerely asked god for an opportunity to share the gospel with them and god created it you know and i believe that he's hearing all of us i'm, I'm not special you know, I don't receive any special honor from God um, above anybody else. And if God was willing to hear that prayer and answer, I believe that he will answer your prayer, sis, when he sees this burden on your heart for your friends. And just ask him for an opportunity and ask him to guide the opportunity when it comes for you to share with your friends, you know. And I, and I believe he will. You know, but God, God has really given us an opportunity and, and, a, and a unction to, to reach out to, to, to whether backslidden Seventh-day Adventists are people who don't know God currently. You know, we, we are bidden to go into the highway and hedges and into all the world to, to reach some for Christ, you know, to reach as many as possible. So I hope that helped Sister Marsha and I say, yeah. Jade's hand and, and, and brother Schooler. Hope it helped, Marsha. Yes, it did. Thank you. You're welcome. Wait for them to. I, I definitely will. Yeah. Jade and, and then Howard. Hi, good evening, everyone. Evening. Um yes. Well, you you've really answered it. Answer the question, I believe. Um what I was gonna add is um, my own experience when I was young and um, my I was invited to church. I didn't immediately go because, you know, at the time, Saturday was the best day to do in your eyes to do all manner of stuff. And uh, the young lady that was asking me, she she was very persistent in asking me and they were my playmates, uh, persons who I would go with, you know. We were around, we were neighbors, we were friends. And um, I remember I remember one Sabbath morning, she, she saw me and she said to me, are you sure you finished doing what you're doing? And I said, yes, I am. Because all well, my mother is, if I needed to go somewhere, I had to do everything I needed to do, my duties and stuff. So... She said, why you don't come to church with me? And I said to her next week. And it pricked my heart. And then next week came and I didn't go. And then I went to church. And about two and a half weeks after that, I requested baptism. Why? Praise God. Because when I went, the pastor was preaching about the Sabbath. And I never saw that before. Like, I used to go to church on Sunday. I never say anything about Sabbath. I was like, that was in the commandments. It's like it blew my mind. And so I decided to get baptized and to give my heart to God. So Sister Marsha, keep praying for your friends. Um, there's a passage of scripture that I want to share. 
and um, it's linked with it's linked with other text. Uh, there's a second. It is uh, Proverbs, Proverbs eighteen verse twenty four. A man that has friends must show himself friendly, Amen. and there is a friend that stick it closer than a, a brother. Amen. And you can link that to Proverbs seventeen and Proverbs twenty seven ten. Um, you know, not because they're not in the church, you're going to shun them, but. Just be guided and ask the Lord, you know, when you're invited out, Lord, you know, it is, is it your will for me to go at this event? And if the Lord permits you, by your eating habits and your conversation, you might just stir up a conversation that will lead somewhere. And never give up because Christ never give up, gave up on us. Amen. And we shouldn't give up on our friends. Thank you so much for that, sister, because was there, that was kind of um, another part that was kind of um, pressing on me, you know, like what activities and the extent of interaction that, you know, I should allow because these are friends for, of mine who grew up in the same Sabbath school or parents are friends and, you know, so... I'm glad that you emphasize using that text that it's not really for us to shun them. Mm -hmm. And as you say, um, the environment may create an opportunity for me to show a difference or be different. And maybe that will encourage them or remind them of the truth that they were exposed to and they, that they once believed with all of their hearts so and, and thank you for that part and, and i and i sincerely believe and thank you also sister jade i sincerely believe that if you go say for instance they invite you out to a dinner and you go with the intent to win souls i believe god actually will attend every effort that you undertake yeah because jesus went everywhere you know even to places that people would question why is he in these places but jesus's primary motive was always winning souls mm -hmm. so so he never went to participate in in any wrongdoing you know but he always went to places that um other people would shun you know and he would associate with people that other people would shun but his chief motive was the redemption of man and as long as you are going to the social activities with it, with that in the back of your mind, you know, I, I, I am going to win my friends back to Christ. I believe that God will attend your efforts. I believe that wholeheartedly. And I don't know if I'm wrong for saying this, you know, but this is something I have observed that when you are in the company of say, former Adventists, it's the hardest set of people to try mm -hmm. to witness to. Yep. Because when I am at work, for example, where I am not surrounded by persons who know of the Advent message or what we really preach, them only know say you go to church on Saturday. But when you're in a conversation and you and you get to explain and show Bible principle and you know, just Bible facts. They are so much more receptive than your own brother and sister who will kind of say, Lord, that's not important. Or God not said me for that. You know? Yeah. And sometimes it is so surprising to hear that from your fellow brothers and sisters. So sometimes it is kind of not encouraging yeah. or worrisome. Yes. We continue to pray. Um, brother Schooler, see your hand. Um, yes. um, good night again, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Night night. All right. Um, boy, the, the answers were right on, on par, right um, to the point and, and clear um, and helpful. Um, and it's so right, it says, when, when it comes to Adventists and witnessing to them, they can be the most difficult set to witness to um, because they already know some part of the truth. Maybe not all, but they know some part, which sometimes people consider to be the whole truth. 
and they don't have anything else to learn. And then sometimes they're, they're thinking, how oh, dare you try to teach me? But um, we have to do our best. And as Wazari said, you pray. Pray for God to, to create the opportunity. Don't force in anything. You just ask God for opening the door and then walk to the door as soon as it's open. Um, a text came to mind as you asked the question. It is Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59, if you could look at it. Isaiah 59, and you, you can read the whole passage. But I just want to look from verse 14 to 17. If you permit me, I just read the, um, these four verses. And it says, Judgment is turned away backward, and justice standing afar off. For truth is falling to the street, and um, equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departed from evil maketh himself a prey. Mm. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness is sustained him. For he put it on righteousness as a breastplate, and as an helmet of salvation upon his head, and he put on the garment of vengeance for the clothing, and was clad with zeal as a cloak. And this 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 passage um, put forward one one thing that that was already said earlier that and and I just repeated you pray if you notice God says he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor apart from your personal witness you know, apart from what you say to your friends it, what you say to God is utmost important. God is always asking us to intercede. We can do more for our friends than by intercession than anything else because God will not enter into their lives without permission. And if they are not going to give God that, that permission, if somebody in their family asks, and that family mean human family, asks that God interfere or intervene in their lives, God then has the permission to enter and to make changes in their life, right? We're in. If we had not asked, he would not have entered into the situation. So he needs an intercessor. So when, like, um, for instance, as you have seen, that they're, they're in problems in terms of they have turned away from God, you can intercede for them. And also, as you intercede, ask for as was already said, uh, a, a door or a gate, anything, a window of opportunity that you may put in a word for the Lord. But the intercession is very, very important. So just pray, keep on in for them, continue to talk to God about them and until something happens. Right? I hope that helps. Um, was there, after the other question, um, the way how this principle of intercession was just explained, I've never thought of it like that in terms of the permission. So when you finish answering the other question for the person that had their hand up, I don't know if you could shed some more light on this whole intercessory um, principle. Because I've we've always heard it, but as my brother explained, I've never heard it explained like that in terms of permission and how you allow God to to intervene on somebody's behalf. Yeah man, it, it, that that that's exactly what you I just just will just segue here. That it, um oh that is one hundred percent correct, you know. Oh you're basically inviting God into a situation but but God's role is not to um brainwash the person against their own will um, mm -hmm. it is inviting god into a scenario and what god will do god will act as far as he possibly can to convict the person that you are praying for so example abraham was living in the right place and living the right way and god um in the form of christ came down 
to earth and Abraham was hospitable and it moved the Lord to the point where the Lord said that, am I going to hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? You know, and when he revealed himself to Abraham and his intentions towards Saddam, Abraham immediately started to intercede. And Abraham interceded because primarily Abraham loved everybody who was living there. He was concerned generally about the people living there, you know, because he had previously helped them in a battle. And even despite their lifestyle, Abraham still was concerned for everybody. But primarily, he was concerned for his nephew and his nephew's family. And we see where God stepped into the scenario. But he was a forcing lot to make a decision. The angels came and the angels personated human beings. Visitors visiting Saddam and Gomorrah. So they created scenarios and it tested Lot's character. And Lot saw them lodging out there in the street and he acted. So they created scenarios to move upon him and to lure him into a scenario while Abraham was interceding. He showed himself to be hospitable, showed that some of the character traits that Abraham instilled in him was still evident and still with him. You know, and because of his hospitality, just like Abraham, the Lord revealed himself well the angels of the lord revealed it themselves to him and and showed that they were really on a rescue mission and of course we know that three persons survived that and and mrs lot unfortunately died but but in everything because of abraham's intercession we see we are they never forced anybody because if if the will was forced mrs lot would not have died she still had free moral agency. She could have chosen bad and she desired to remain with her goods and whoever else she had living in, in, in Sodom and Gomorrah. So, so she perished because her heart was not there um, where she was rescued and taken to. Her heart was back in that city. So it even shows that God is willing to give us up to what we desire, even with the best intercession. But what he did do was create circumstances to convict those being interceded for. So, so that chapter of, of, of Genesis allows me to understand how intercession works. You are inviting God into your scenario and, your, and to stand in the gap in the relationships that you have established. But God is not forcing anybody's will. But you are inviting him into these relationships that you have established and um, he will work as much as he can to convict hearts, you know, and he will create scenarios to convict these hearts. And, and that is what we do when we intercede. We, we invite God into scenarios. That is how I understand it, based on several passages of scripture. So I hope that made sense, um, Sister Marsha. Um, was it? Yeah. Um, if I may um, also add, um, if you you can see the same operation with Moses, yeah, um, and um, Israel when um, at the the mount on Mount Sinai, yeah, where they built the the golden calf, they were in serious trouble. Yeah, they were dead in the water. If if God being a just God, and then just entering the covenant relationship, the covenant operations that if they had transgressed the law then they should die right because they have just worshipped a, a idol which the law state that they should not but god know what the, what he could not do anything but be god he had to be judged he could not do the same two things at the same time so he needed an intercessor he needed a man to stand in the gap between the living and the dead so what he did was to inform Moses. And if you read the passage, it's a very lovely passage because it shows how God was actually pleading for help for, for his people who have gone astray. For he said, Moses, leave me alone that I may destroy them and make you a great nation. By, by, by law, by justice, they should have been destroyed. But he was saying, Moses, if you leave me alone, the, the argument was, if you leave me alone, this is the, the inevitable result. They would die. He needed somebody now to stand on their behalf. And Moses catching the thought 
did that. He stood in the gap for them. He prayed for them. He sincerely pleaded for them. And he used the exact the promises of God to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And even the fact that God had led them out of the out of Egypt in the sight of Eden and how his name would have been been marred and, and um, tarnished because he had not brought them to the um, promised land. And his intercession was successful. You understand? He stood Amen. before for God on their behalf. And if you read it, it is so lovely to see this little man standing before the eternal God and said, God, you can't do that because X, Y, and Z. And he interceded. And the same thing that God always called us to do. Unfortunately, unlike Moses, sometimes we don't get the vision. Sometimes we see the brother and the sister fall. And we think say, it is God calling us to criticize and even to spread it a little further that they are falling. But it's not God that God is asking us to do. Satan is already on that job. We got the position they don't take already. That is called accuser and of the brethren. What God is asking us to do is really to plead on their behalf. And as your, bread, as, your, as your brother and sister, you can cuss them out. You can tell them, say, you know what? This is not the road that you should be taking. But sometimes you have to even pray for yourself that the right word at the right time may come. And that what you say may have an eternal effect upon their lives. Amen. Amen. Thank you for those points. Very good question, Sister Marsha. Um, any other questions for the evening? Um, Elder Wazi, I have one in a brother, brother Wazi. Yes, brother Skula. <laughs> oh, what? Are you hearing me? Are you yes, hearing yes, me? yes, brother Skula. All right, the church, the Seventh day Adventist church, can it be referred to at any point in its history as Babylon? And if not, why not? All right. <laughs> that's a very that's a very good question, Brother Schooler. And and to answer the question, I will go to the book of Revelation. <clears throat> I will go to the book of Revelation to answer that question. Now, in Revelation chapter 17, a description is given of Babylon. A description is given of Babylon. She has certain tenets and character traits. In Revelation chapter 17, it says, And there came one of the seven angels, which are the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show you, show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. So this whore sits upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of the wrath of our fornication and we know of course this wine because they get intoxicated this wine wine represents doctrine you know when christ talks about new wine into old wine skins it, he spoke of doctrine now this 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 system does not have new wine, which is an un, uh, um, unfermented alcohol. New wine is, is basically grape juice because grape juice cannot intoxicate. It is new wine, but this one intoxicates. So it is not new wine. It is, it is fermented wine. That means it is solid. And that would mean that this system has false doctrines. So Babylon has false doctrines. So he carried out carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast. So Babylon also sits on a scarlet colored beast. And we know, of course, according to Daniel 7 verses 24 and 25, a beast represents a kingdom. So this, is, so this church sits upon a kingdom. This church rules a civil power. So Babylon rules a civil power. 
So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman has, was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So she is the mother of harlots. That means that other systems come out of Babylon that resemble her, have characteristics just like she has. So she has produced other young ladies or other churches have come out of her that she heavily influences. Now, the Seventh-day Adventist church cannot be Babylon at any given point because one, the, the Seventh-day Adventist church does not um, sire any other denominations. It has no harlot daughters, harlot daughters because the Seventh-day Adventist church does not sire any other church. The Seventh-day Adventist church is God's remnant church. You know, so that is one disqualifying mark why, why Seventh-day Adventism could not be Babylon. The Seventh-day Adventist Church does not rule over any civil power. There is no civil power that the Seventh-day Adventist Church rules over. This woman, on, uh, um, on the other hand, actually sits, meaning to sit in control of, you know, just like how a cowboy rides a horse in a rodeo or a bull, a bull tamer rides a bull. Um, you know, those rodeo people that ride bulls and so on. Once you are on the beast, you are in control of the beast. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is, in, is, is never in control of any civil system or civil government system. So the Seventh-day Adventist Church cannot be Babylon because Babylon has certain criterions and identifying marks as outlined in Revelation 17. So Babylon sires other women that resemble her and have character traits just like her. So, 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 so any church that is Babylon must produce other little churches. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has never done that, so it cannot be Babylon. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is not in control of any civil power. The Seventh-day Adventist Church um, is not arrayed in scarlet and purple. You know, the Seventh-day Adventist Church adopts all the principles of the sanctuary. Babylon just deals with the, 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 the purple and scarlet. So. It presents itself as something regal and, 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 and royal. And it, and it also acknowledges the sacrifice of Christ. But the color blue is missing because Babylon is not amenable to any law of God. You know? And the Seventh-day Adventist Church, of course, puts all Ten Commandments to the forefront. So the Seventh-day Adventist Church can never be Babylon. Our prophet Sister White says, we are in danger of, of, of becoming a sister to fallen Babylon. And what she said is that we are in danger. She never said that we have become a sister. And many like to quote that thing and say that, um, is, that this has been fulfilled where we are now a sister. Inspiration has never referred to the Seventh-day Adventist Church of a sister to Babylon. What she did say is that we are in danger. That means we are going on a road of, 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 of regression and, 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 and we, are, we are adapting bad principles as time goes on. But even in that, we, we are never going to ever fulfill the identifying marks that constitutes Babylon because the Seventh-day Adventist Church has been raised up to be a conduit for the truth of God. And, and in the order of revelation, it goes only to seven churches. There is no fourth church. Ellen White puts forward a principle where she says that the church militant is not the church triumphant. And, and, and um, I think at a different study, we can go through some of the parables of Christ, like the parable of the, of the net being cast and, and, and you're bringing good and bad fish. You know, Christ, Christ showing that the gospel net goes out and it brings in everybody, good and bad fish. But there's a selection process where some of the bad fish are, are identified and cast out and rejected and the good fish remain. There's also the, the, the parable of the sower. 
And Ellen White said that that parable is the foundation of all the other parables. That, that is the preeminent parable. Because all the parables speak to the principles contained in the parable of the sower. And this, the seed is just, the gospel seed is going everywhere. The gospel seed is going to all. You know, the, the wedding garment was, 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 was being offered to everybody. The wedding feast invitation went to everybody. Jesus spoke of the wheat and the tears growing together until the time of harvest. You know, so there will never be a scenario until the judgment of the living takes place when you have a whole wheat kind of situation. You know, so it is very, it is very dangerous. It is very dangerous, even in light of prophecy. It is very dangerous to take a stance that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is now Babylon. The prophet of the Lord goes as far as to say that any person who identifies the Seventh-day Adventist Church as Babylon was never raised up by God to be a, to, to be a, mouth, a, 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 a spokesperson for him. She actually says that. No man speaking under the direction of the Holy Spirit, she outlined, caused the Seventh-day Adventist Church Babylon. So when, when, when we hear those terms, she clearly gave us a clue as to who is guiding people who call the church Babylon. Um, I'm not ignorant to the fact that there are some problems within, not even just some, there are some serious problems in our church. There are persons within our church that want to undermine the, the theological system that God guided these pioneers to create and, 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 and were forged by men who love the Lord. Yes, there are attempts. There, is a, there are apostates in the church, but the church is never in apostasy because the church militant is not the church triumphant. You will have wheat and tears until the harvest time, and the harvest time is the end of the world. When that time commences, God takes upon himself the work of separating the wheat from the tears. In the parable, it is clearly shown that angels undertake this work. Angels that are divinely guided by God undertake the work of separation. But when men take it upon themselves to separate the church and to, and to say, yes, come to me and stay with me because I, I am creating an all-wheat system, then those men are in trouble. Because the, the parable that was, was spoken by Jesus Christ himself, who is God in the flesh, outlined that the, 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 the harvesters are holy angels. And, the, and, 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 the, and it's not in a case where the word angelos is used to just mean messenger. These holy angels are divine beings given spiritual insights as to who now belongs to the Lord. And that work of separation takes place during the period of time where, 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 where the judgment of the living commences. Brethren, let us not get distracted and, 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 and focus upon, you know, I was even saying it to somebody this week. When they talk about the errors in the church and they say that, boy, you know, this is a Babylonian system because it has errors. After the intertestamental period, that, 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 that eventually Israel got very influenced by Greek Hellenism um, during that, that rise of the Third Empire, Grisha. That 400-year gap between Malachi and Matthew, several schools of erroneous teaching was in God's remnant church. The Jews were God's remnant people. They were the oracles of God. And several schools of erroneous teaching were in the church when Christ came. Some of the leading men in the church, the book Desire of Ages says that even though the, the, the Pharisees had more influence, a lot of the times because of money and, 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 and the wealth base of the Sadducees, they were always the ones that got the, the, the office of high priest. She said that some of these people were guilty of murdering people for an office. So this was not just, just some theological fallout. You know? People were being murdered so that somebody can have a church office. And this is the church which Christ came and saw. And the Bible says, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and reasoned from the scriptures. So the actual historic context of Jesus Christ was that he never went to an all-pure church. You had the Sadducees who were materialistic. They were materialists. And they believe that, 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 that this life is all that you have. You know, they, 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 they scoffed at, 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 at doctrine. They scoffed at it. 
you know, they scoffed at the idea of a resurrection or, or, or the existence of angels. And these people were prominent leaders in the church, doubters and scoffers and janglers. And Jesus still went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Then there were the present truth as called the Pharisees who were extremists, you know, hygienists and, and went overboard and added to the law. I'm um, saying that their abstemiousness with, 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 can constitute righteousness and they were self-righteous and judgmental. You still have that in the church. Yeah, they are the Herodians who mixed up in politics and thought that if they try to run fast a seat in, in Caesar's government, that would expand the influence of the church. Yeah, the zealots that like people like Barnabas and those people. Yeah, that yeah, yeah, the Essenes that 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 took an extreme view of country living and scorned the rest of society. And they lived out there in the wilderness and said that they never wanted to solid themselves by coming into contact with, with the average people because they were too vile and, and seen as plenty, you know. So all these extremists and, and offshoot groups existed in the time that Christ had as it as his custom to go into the synagogue on the Sabbath day to reason. So Jesus never went to a pure church. Jesus went to a church with people with foolish views and false doctrines and constant arguments week after week about doctrines. That is the context, the actual historic context that Jesus went to church in. That was his actual historic context. So, so brethren, if we are going to look at the current um, state of affairs in, in the, in the Seventh-day Adventist church and rule it out as God's remnant church and say that, boy, we should never have anything to do with that church, then Jesus should not have had anything to do with the church back then. You know, out of an entire nation, only 120 souls were prepared on the day of Pentecost to receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Out of an entire nation. Out of an entire... Yes, Kerry, they actually murdered people for a church office. And Jesus was full of the Holy Ghost. So I believe that at some point, Jesus would have known that some of the leaders in church killed for the office that they had. You know, and yet still Jesus went into the synagogue to reach a genuine Seventh-day Adventist at, at, in his day. So, so the church will never be Babylon. Yes, we are in danger of behaving like a, a, a sister to Babylon, but we will never be Babylon. The Seventh-day Adventist church can never be Babylon. It is an impossibility for the Seventh-day Adventist church to be Babylon. That, that, is, that, that is grossly, prophetically, and theologically incorrect. And anyone who goes on a road to proclaim her thus severs himself from the leading of the Holy Spirit himself. Because the prophet of the Lord says that nobody being guided by the Holy Spirit would call the church Babylon. So Amen. I, Amen. I, hope, that, I hope that helped, brother, brother, brother Scola. Amen. Um, it, it, it does, you know. It does. Um and and you're so correct. Um as you look at what Christ, how oh Christ angled the situation, because all of us um, sometimes question, you know, our relationship with the church and how do we, we approach the church. But we can see that in Christ. We see what Christ, how Christ angled it. He, as you said, it wasn't pure people he came to. Everybody had problems. Even the disciples had problems. But he never um, shunned them because they had problems. And just as, as you know, this is tied to the first question. What do you do when you have virgins who have turned back from the principle that God has um, given them? And we see not only just some, but a lot, a lot of persons all in leadership who have gone back, who have turned from the principles that have been given by God. And how we deal with them is the same way we can't we deal with everybody else. Amen. We pray for them. We Amen. pray for them. And when you get the opportunity, you talk to them and you tell the truth as it is in God, not in 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 um when I say this um self holy and right holier than the um um attitude as if we are there and they are not. Yeah. No. But in sympathy for know that basically if a virgin them go astray and a virgin I them are gonna die. It's not just it's not just we not an argument, you know. This is a life and death issue. Amen. Everyone that turns steps off the road will die. Amen. And, that, and it's no and there's no what I call it. There is no exception. And there's no and there's no one that cannot be fall underneath it. The condemnation. 
So we have to really have sympathy for our brethren if we think that they have gone off the, 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 the path, pray for them um, where we can um, ask for an opportunity that we may say a word in season to help yeah. them. And just like Christ, Christ work with them, he work with them, and then at the last, he really give it to them. Um, the last part, your what do you call them? Um, wash, um, something, wash, white, wash, 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 the white it's a polka and give them in, in everything, but not it, it, all of that, you know, was just an effort to say, Bridging, if I'm not turning on the nose, then I'm not going to kill me and basically bring the wrath of God upon, upon the city. All of that was just to turn them aside from what they were going to do. But, but, but brother, 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 mm -hmm. scholar, you know that mm -hmm. even when you read the book without any bias, like you read the Bible without any bias, mm -hmm. even when the gospel went to the Gentiles, even when the gospel went to the Gentiles, mm -hmm. the apostles, including the apostles, as Apostle Paul, and this is historic fact, his attitude towards his countrymen by blood, the Jews, was always redemptive. Always. Do you know that the book of Hebrews was actually written in an, in an attempt to still win Hebrews, the Jews? Mm -hmm. And the book was written um some 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 theologians um some theologians some some historians actually asserting that based on the year that and the timelines that it was written hebrews would have been compiled in the year ad 66 that is the year of the first siege and Cestius. so paul gave them this book because and when you read the burden of the book it is to get their minds off the, the, the economy of the Jews as they had it with this temple system and all those things to get their minds and the system, the temple system in heaven, the sanctuary in heaven, and Christ's ministration there. Because mm -hmm. everything that they knew earthly would be destroyed. The entire system would be destroyed. And Paul wrote the book of Hebrews as an attempt. AD 66, you know. AD 66. Is 35 years after Christ was crucified and ascended, you know. Mm. So for 35 years, mercy still was was being extended to these people, you know. Mm -hmm. who, who crucified the Lord Himself, probation closed on them in the in the sense of them being God's um representative body. But Jesus was still appealing to individual Hebrews. So, 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 even if, when you look at the historic context, because people like to say probation closed on the Jews and probation will close on the Seventh day Adventists, so we shouldn't labor for Seventh day Adventists. So, that uh, if they if 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 false doctrine come into the church, we must just move and not care about anybody in the church because they want the false doctrines and probation closed on the Jews, so probation close on Seventh day Adventists. But look at the dealings with God through his apostles when probation closed on them as a nation one of the greatest of all the apostles still labored with all his might and effort to win his countrymen according to the flesh he still strived to win them even after probation closed what is god saying there i'm not i'm not saying i'm not cognizant of the falls and issues that are in the seventh day adventist church you know but the Bible stands as a blueprint as to how we must deal with these issues. And often times, mm -hmm. the truth of the matter is, it is not being done according to biblical principles. You know, mm -hmm. people, people are quicker to, 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 to want to see the destruction of people that they disagree with. Whether it is the people who separate and create their own movements, or even those in the church, because sometimes the leadership in the church and even the people in the pew, are desirous of seeing these people who have independent ministries destroyed and neither of them have the spirit of god neither Amen. of them know god Amen. because how can you hate your brother who you can see and claim to love god who you cannot see that is the question john poses so neither group of these people have the spirit of god they are the so, spirit of the devil that no. that is destructive in nature and wants to see people lost you know 
So they delight in seeing bad things happen to either person in the camp. I remember even when COVID-19 um was 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 you know a prominent issue and some of the leadership took a vaccine. I never got vaccinated. Some of the leadership were promoting the vaccine and they got sick. I you know people were celebrating the fact that these people got sick and, and were dying. They actually celebrated the fact. And and brethren, in the name of so-called present truth, when you reach a point where you are you are salivating and celebrating when somebody is dying, it shows that you are the divide of the spirit of God. You are actually in trouble. So on either side, that is there's this satanic spirit of emulation and hatred, you know. And if nobody has victory over that spirit, the two parties are going to hell. That is a fact. Because no murderer has eternal life dwelling in him. You know? So, so brethren, you know, instead of trying to pin the name Babylon and, 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 and your fellow countrymen, you know, we have to be careful and, and, and obey the principles set forth in, 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 in the book of Leviticus 23, where the work is to afflict your own soul. Mm -hmm. and the truth is, if you, when you, if you are, if the more time you spend to acquaint yourself with yourself, you'll realize that you, you, you need to afflict your own soul. You, you have some issues that will keep you out of it. And that is why the burden of the tenth day of the seventh month, the day of atonement, is for the individual to remedy defects in their own characters. You know? Yes, you can entreat your brother. You can correct in doctrine and so. And the Bible even tells you that even when you are in a position to do that, you do it in a spirit of meekness, lest thou be overcome in a similar fall. That is what the Bible actually says, you know? And the mm -hmm. reason why you must do it in a spirit of meekness is because you share the common humanity with the person at fault and that common humanity that you share with them is susceptible to sin. It can sin if you take your eyes off of Christ, just like Peter sank when, when he started to focus on his friends and, and started to think he was walking on water. That is what will happen to you when you feel like, oh, I'm living a good life and I'm so wonderful based on my own strength and efforts. You'll actually sink. You'll actually sink into sin. So the Bible says, even if you are going to correct somebody, do it in a spirit of meekness, lest they'll be overcoming a similar fault. Because all of us have the same common humanity. None of us are, are higher, stronger than the other. That is why Christ died for all of us. We all need a savior. If we could save ourselves yeah. by the deeds of the law, we would not need justification through Christ and his redemptive blood. So, so, so I, I hope what I said made sense. Um, yeah, um, okay. I see some hands. I, 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 I just want to acknowledge your hands. Um, you were saying something, Schooler? Yeah, man. I said that basically is more than 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 just sense, you know. You know, said so this is the 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 the, 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 the craftiness of the enemy at its best, where you can have two sets of people, both on the other side, but the two of them sharing the same spirit, and I not understand so them sharing the same spirit. Yep. And the two of them satanic in nature and don't even understand that that what they are doing, even though it's mass under the guise of godliness, is actually satanic. And mm. I, I remember some, somebody said it to me today. The person was comparing me to, to John. I mean, and I said to her, but John was, was faulty. He was failing. And she said, John, no, man, John, all right, man. I said, no. John was called the son, the, the son of thunder. Mm. This was the same brethren, the same John who write the revelation that called down fire to burn up the Samaritans, them who wanted to call down fire to burn up the Samaritans because they would not allow Jesus to pass through their tomb because they saw he was going to Jerusalem. Mm. And Jesus looked on them and said, you do not know what kind of spirit you are of. I have not come to destroy men. But to save them. And that is the same thing that is happening. Yep. When we start to feel bitter. Our bitterness against our brethren them. Because we disagree with them. And they have said things to hurt us. Or we have said things. It you know, really matter. But once the bitterness start coming in. Mm. And we hate them. And we want. And, and when they are in trouble. We do not want to pray for them. Neither to admonish them. Nor intercede on their behalf. Then we have taken on the spirit of the enemy. Yep. We are accusers of the brethren them. Definitely. And this is not to palliate or to excuse the garbage that is being being done in our church. It's not doing that. 
No. It's not to say that we are right in, in that, that anybody is right to step off the commandments of God to support any worldly organization or any worldly principle. We're not doing that. But we say as you correct somebody, uh, correct the situation, you have to do so with utmost humility because we are never too far from the ground. We are never too far from falling. Amen. So, so I see Brother Haynes, your hand, Marsha, and Brother Booth. Brother Brian. Yeah, yeah man. Where was I? Yeah, um, I'm learning quite a, bit of, quite a bit of stuff so far. Um, so I want to make a comment and then a question, basically. Um, indeed, the Seventh-day Adventist Church can never be Babylon, because if, if you're a church, you're the body of Christ. So... And I guess that would be in its truest form. So yeah, 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 yeah. you would never become Babylon. However, you do have, unfortunately, you have some leaders of the church that really seem to be trying to get the 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 the, the church in a in a in a state to to be called a daughter of Babylon due to the ecumenical movements and such forth. Mm-hmm. But fortunately, you know, just as somebody had commented, you know, I have. Uh, Seven thousand um, prophets who have not needed to 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 be or Ashtar or whatever you do. So we have to um by grace keep in the faith. But um in terms of the whole wine aspect and what have you to back and such for um what is Luke five I believe where we talk about um putting a new piece of garment or all um and then then the both the new make of a rent and the piece was taken out of the new I create not with the old. I know my put this new wine into old bottles else the new wine will burst the bottle and be spilled and the bottles are perished. But new wine must be put into new bottles and both are preserved. No man having drunk old wine straightway desires new for he saith the old is better. You know, I I am under the um, impression that the the wine and what have you was talking about here at least is talking about um especially the new wine is talking about the the holy spirit because um i'm thinking about it in terms of for the full indwelling of the holy spirit um not to say that the holy spirit does not use persons who have um went through by faith um a cleansing away from sin and such forth but for full indwelling the holy spirit you over turning over your life completely to god for him to work to you to cleanse up the sins and such forth and then mighty works are able to go forth from you um when it be a case in which this here definition here would of new wine would be something there would be um the Holy Spirit and the uh, old wine for example would be in a way that all of us have walked and sometimes double with at the very least no um or wine the old spirit the which would be Satan basically um because if we're living a life of sin and such forth and you know, we're not going to straightway desire for new or straightway desire typically for the Holy Spirit to come in and such forth because like I said the old the old way of doing stuff is bigger, you know, the simple ways of what to do. We desire our carnal mind, our carnal body will desire sinful uh, things of sinful nature. So um what 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 say? Um well, the the, the the um the, the spirit of God really is responsible for all aspects of truth. So the Holy Spirit, even though um Christ used the the, 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 the um the, the wine to speak of doctrine in nature, um the the, 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 the um the Holy Spirit is the one that guides us in terms of what to believe and what not to believe, what to accept and what to reject. You know, um, so it's not something that um, I find hard to reconcile. You know, 
in terms of it, it being ex, um it, 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 it being you know, with, 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 the, with the spirit of or the work of the Holy Spirit. Um I'm just looking for the direct um reference where it, it says that in this particular case though when he spoke using the, the symbol of wine he actually spoke of doctrine that that was the actual intended um usage of the term wine in in that particular passage to use it to represent doctrine it's just like water um water is used to represent christ himself but water is used to represent the work of the holy spirit water is used to represent people you know so there are they, they, a lot of parallels are attached to to to, to ver um, various symbols but um i'm just looking for the text but but there is no challenge really in terms of um looking at, at, at the standpoint of the work of the holy spirit because even doctrines are are, are just instruments used by the holy spirit to guide people along the path we have eternal life okay so what you're saying that the possibly like it almost seems somewhat um synonymous in a sense because if, if truth and be told um jesus is the truth and how to know falls from from the truth is that you look at the doctrine and see if it lines up and match up to watch up to what the bible is saying exactly i remember that the, 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 the scriptures themselves were written by the holy spirit these men were moved by the holy spirit so the author of the bible is actually the holy spirit okay makes sense makes sense all right yeah um sister marsha so i hope that helped brand yeah, no. thanks um sister marsha i saw your hand yes i mean um we've kind of moved away from the initial question about if the seventh day adventist church could be called babylon but uh, um i just wanted to say that when Brother School posed the question, uh, I kind of knitted up my brow immediately and I was like, absolutely, even before hearing your response and even using Revelation to, to show the characteristics of Babylon, I was just thinking to myself that of the many times when Christ himself or in the Bible where you see um, God is upset with the children of Israel or the church. He himself has never ever referred to them as Babylon. You know, the highest level of angriness that you ever see God express. I think the most God ever referred to the church as is like a harlot yeah. or whatever yeah. else, but God himself has never, ever classified the Hebrew children, the Jews, or anybody, the church, the remnant, never, ever. So I was saying, if God can't, if God don't call me Babylon, <laughs> nobody else can have called us Babylon. Amen. Amen. Um, just I wanted to add that. Amen. Yeah. Um, brother Booth, thank you for that. Question. Yeah, happy to out everyone. You know, and concerning the Babylon story, you know, Christ mentioned upon this rock I build my church and the gates of hell cannot prevail. You know, so if the church as people claim it to be Babylon, is Babylon. That means they, they are calling Christ Babylon. Mm -hmm. Because he stated, upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell cannot prevail. So you know, no, Babylon cannot prevail against God's church. You, you, you rightly said, 
yes, there are a lot of issues inside of the church, which is true. But the day is coming when God will take care of all the issues. Amen. But the question, brother, Jay, who is, you know anything about Hostef? You tell? Yeah, whatever. My pronunciation. <laughs> might not uh, Victor Yutef. Uh, Victor Yutef is a gentleman that came up sometime shortly after the passing of Sister Ellen White. And Victor Yutef made a, a, a claim. Ellen White had a particular dream where she saw a man with a dustpan in his hand. Like one of those little shovel things that we used to, to shovel up um, dust and so on in a bedroom. And this gentleman was seen taking up dust out of an a, 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 a area and some jewels were in the dust. And then when he took the dust and the jewels, he then separated the jewels and then put them in order. And actually, when you look at the overall vision, Ellen White was really speaking about the influence of Christ upon the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Christ came and, and, and separated the dust, the confusion and so on, and gave us our fundamental beliefs through the, through the, through the pioneer brethren that lead, led out in the work. But Victor Yutef took it upon himself to interpret that he is that actual man with a dustpan in his hand. And he appointed himself a new prophet. And Victor Hutef actually is responsible for the formation of a group called the Shepherd's Rod. So Shepherd's Rod um, recognized Victor Hutef as a prophet. But, but Victor Hutef never passed any of the required tests for a prophet. You know? But, but Shepherd's Rod... Um, Ident uh, identify him as the new prophet that rose up after Ellen White and, and, and they take his writings and, and, and guides as prophetic you know they believe that his writings are inspired counsel you know and that it is why it's so dangerous when it, it is a very dismissive way the church well not the entire church but many brethren in the church when um they want to bring in ideas and so on. And it, it actually strays from pioneer teaching. It strays from the principles of Adventism. One of the quickest ways to shut people down is to call them shepherds, right? You know, and it is very, it's a dismissive way to deal with people. And, 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 and they, it, it's kind of pejorative in nature to just blanket everybody as a shepherd's right? That disagrees with, with, with what is happening in the church because... The gross majority of these people that raise concerns that come up in the church don't believe that Yotef is, is even a prophet. Most people that are being called shepherds right, don't even know that there's a gentleman called Victor Yotef. You know, the church just uses it as a blanking statement to, to shut people up in church. So they just say that these people are shepherds right, and the minute you call people that, they are scorned and, and derided in the church. And, and that is just a way to, 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 to shut them down. And it is bearing false witness against your brethren. So if we are going to be, if we are going to be um, going who about Sabbath observance, you know, we have to remember that there's a commandment that says we are not to bear false witness against our neighbor. So when you call somebody a shepherd's rod without any evidence of it, you are actually a liar in God's sight. You are actually bearing false witness. And if you continue to do so, you, without any repentance, you will lose out on heaven, just as all we like to point out that people who willingly break the Sabbath are going to lose out on heaven, are people that steal and kill are going to lose out on heaven. You are going to lose out on heaven if you are calling people shepherds, right? When the people are not shepherds, right? Or you don't have any evidence that they adhere to the teachings of Victor Yutef. You know, when you are doing that, you are actually lying, you know. And there are many liars in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you know, in leadership and in the pew. So a, a shepherd's right is somebody who believes that Victor Hutef is a prophet. If that person does not believe that, they cannot be a shepherd's right. 
Amen. So I, I hope that helps, Brother Boo. Amen, 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 brother. I, I see you on Brother Mike. Oh, sorry. Mike. Sorry? Hello, G. Um, of, of Shepherd's Rod. Mm -hmm. I think I can say a lot of people are using it incorrectly because I remember growing up, anybody who well know that that anybody know that would you say practice any type of reform whether it be dress reform or in terms of food whatever it is they're labeled as shepherd's word i remember hearing that people who come to church and don't wear roll on and wear long skirts and don't cream them here all of those persons were labeled as shepherds rod, and that is something that stood out in my mind when I was in Sabbath school, junior and, and primary class. And I think the people who attach these labels to these people, well, maybe the, the, it, the intent can have some maliciousness attached to it, but they really don't even, as I said, know that shepherds rod, they don't know the history of it and that there's actually a man by that name and what he actually did. So sometimes the, the, the burden should be on the church to dispel these things from the pulpit. Yeah. And not in groups. Yeah. It should be dispelled from the pulpit and made wide known the knowledge what exactly Shepherd's Word is, where the history of it, and to stop calling people Shepherd's Word. And it's sad thing. That's what, what, what? When I heard it and I remember the disdain you know shown to those people and i i still remember it from from when i was a child it is just a it's just a simple way to shut down people that you disagree with yeah and it's very underhanded yes. and evil you know yeah. it is very underhanded it is ungodly and christ-like and evil to do that you know and you know sometimes we like to talk about the sins that will come up in the judgment, but we don't we don't mention that as a sin, you know. That bearing a false witness like that yes, is going to come up, and you have people who died doing that, you know. Yes. And that was never confessed. Unconfessed sins will come up in the judgment, you know. And many people did that and never confessed it because they don't never saw it as wrong. But in God's eyes, it is wrong. And if you did that to somebody and live without confessing that, you know. I did that to Brother Brown and I called Brother Brown a shepherd's rod without any evidence. You know, and, and the sad thing is sometimes the, the picture which we paint is that the conscientious people that read a lot and 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 and, and um actually um put stock in the whole thing that the church has a profit and try to eat and dress right and try to be abstemious and obedient to the to the commandments of God. Are all shepherds rod? So, so the way not to be a shepherd's rod is to be rebellious against principle and just, you know, do what you, as you feel like, you know. So if you are if you are Adventist rebel, that is the way we are supposed to live, you know. It, it, I find that so strange that that the people who dress properly, witness, um, study their Bible, um, try to keep the Sabbath conscientiously. Are always often called shepherds, rather. You know, it, 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 what, what are we saying about the church at large? You know, so sad. But um, I see brother Mikey Fowler and sister Renee's hand, Michael, and then sister Ren. Yeah, brother was here. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Um, the, the, the question that the brother posed earlier about, you know, when Jesus says he could not throw new wine in old wine skin. You know, what came to my mind is Revelation 14, verse 8, when we speak about Babylon. Yeah. You know, the, the Bible says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So here we are seeing that the false system of worship has her own wine. Yeah. And the Bible describes it as fornication false doctrines what is in direct opposition to the truth of god Amen. so therefore if jesus is going to pour wine 
it is founded upon true doctrine yeah that which cleanses and sets us free and what so i look at the wine as jesus saying when he came to his own he could not find 12 disciples in the organized church because we know that the pharisees and scribes formed the formal church at that time but christ was saying they were not willing to rid themselves of their customs and traditions so that he could fill them with his truth yeah and so because he could not do that he had to go to the common man that did not have the oracles at their fingertips but they were willing yeah that's why when he called matthew a tax collector even though he was at work in the tax office when Jesus says, follow me, he left immediately yep. and followed him. But those who were in the organized church, they held and they're still holding to their customs and traditions. Now, on the whole matter of shepherd, right, if I can comment briefly on it. <laughs> you know, I find something. It's no longer creeping in our church. It has really found a foothold where the sermon being preached in the secular world is now being preached in the church, which is just love. Mm -hmm. Just love. It doesn't matter about truth. Just love and everything else will follow. But when I study my Bible, in John 14, 15, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. And when I study scripture, I understand that love and obedience, they go together. Amen. Obedience is a byproduct of a love relationship with God. Amen. So we don't obey to be loved. We obey because we love. Amen. Amen. And I find in the church, whenever, and was there, you said it, whenever there are brethren who stand up and say, you know, we need to be obedient to the word, we are shut down because all we need to do is love. So there's no standard in the church anymore. Mm -hmm. God doesn't have a standard. But when you go to Genesis, we see that God made himself the sole arbiter between right and wrong. Yep. But in the secular world, we're being taught that everybody has their own right and wrong. And even in the church. Yep. But guess what? God has placed us as watchmen and watchwomen for the truth. And even when we are persecuted within and without, come what may, Revelation 12 verse 11 says, these are the redeemed. They overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony that they did not love their lives unto the death. Some of us will have to die for the truth, but then we will inherit eternal life. So Amen. let them call us whatever they want to call us. Amen. It's all right. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that, brother Mike. Is that ready? And 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 Diane asks a question, and I'm going to that. Um, sister, ready? I see, I see your your, your hand. Diane. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. So, um, on the same point of um the the shepherd's rod thing, you know, I remember just like Sister Marsha, but my experience was a little different. It was from the pulpit that, you know, it was announced that my group of friends that sit underneath the tree. <laughs> On a Sabbath evening, who my group of friends, my group of friends who share, bring lunch for everybody. When you go to church, and you know bring any lunch, or you don't want the, the, the food that the church provide, that is where everybody going on the same pasta eat from the same pot, you know. And I was so shocked to hear, you know, the, the you know how them derided the group of people and. You know, and then you saw the faces of the people in the church with disgust, and you know, with such. And I couldn't. I was, you know, it was. It is 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 an experience that really was etched in my mind, just like how Sister Marsha's experience was etched in hers. And you know, what I find funny is that they don't stop the tide of those persons that they are calling outcasts of the church. They're not stopping the tide. They're not sending it back. They're not sending back the offering. Right. In fact, they would probably even cost you out that you're not a good steward. Right. You're not a good. I would probably even insert a good shepherd rod steward. 
<laughs> you get what I'm saying? I just just for um you know just for jokes, but you know it's so interesting the values, the the things that we value, and I I I agree with you one hundred percent. Was our was our when you said that they 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 malign the people to the other people, and you know is you you is really bearing false witness. It's really bearing false witness against the virgin, and I don't know. I don't. It, Satan is really a liar for true. He's really a liar for true. So I just wanted to add that. Is the father of lies? Is the father of lies? So, but I have to be careful of the government we align ourselves with. Thank you for that, Sister Renee. Thank you for that. Um, Sister Diane asked a question. She says, "Good evening, Brother Wazari. How are you? Thank. Uh, I'm." To be honest with you, not doing so fantastic, but by God's grace, I will get better with each day, you know, by God's grace, but still hard, you know. Um, so Diane says, I was told by uh, SDA that prayer cannot change God's mind. Can you tell me your views on this, please? Well, the truth is, you know, as I understand it, prayer really does not change God's mind, you know. Prayer, prayer is really designed to change us, you know. Um, yeah, uh, even when we look at Moses interceding, when I was younger, I, I learned about the three omnis that we uh, apply to God. Omnipresence, omniscience, and omnipotence. But even as we look at omniscience, as we look through the lens of prophecy, we see that God has the ability to, to, to foretell things that are not yet, you know. So it can peer um, into the future. You know, nothing occurs to God. God knows everything before it occurs, you know. So, so as we look at a being that, that nothing occurs to, because he knew it would happen. Could it really be that God was surprised and moved by Moses interceding for Israel? Or was Moses demonstrating something? Or, God, or did God create circumstances to pull out that response from Moses so that it is there on, on scriptural record as to how this man could appeal to God and move the heart of God to steer the destruction of Israel? God, God anticipated that before it occurred, you know. He knew it would have happened. So did God really change his mind? You know, sometimes we use terms based on our own limitations as human beings, but God's mind cannot change. God doesn't plan. God purposes because his mind transcends even time. Time is a construct that we are, are, are um, subject to. God is not subject to anything. So, so God doesn't change his mind. And our, our prayers cannot change God's mind. But the purpose of prayer, and I keep referring to Sister White, but she says things in such a beautiful way that, that it, it leaves impressions upon my mind. She says that prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. So, so, so the purpose of prayer is to constantly invite God into our circumstances. God is a gentleman. He's the Lord of hosts. And the, and the host is somebody who entertains another. And what God actually wants us to do is to entertain his presence, just like Enoch walked with God and was not for God, took him. So as we pray, the purpose is to draw man's mind towards God and to God and to connection with God. But in reality, our prayers cannot change God's mind. What it does is change our mind. And the more we pray, and the more we talk to this friend, is the more we are allowed to connect with the mind of this friend. And what happens is that God's ways is higher than our ways as the earth is beneath the heavens. God's ways are higher than our ways. And the more we pray and commune with God, is the more we start to think along his 
frequency. We start to think along his ways. And our minds go up higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. The more time we spend in talking to him, the more time we spend in looking at his word, because that is how we listen. And the more we pray, we talk with our friend, express what is on our heart, and the more we, we listen to study of the scripture, is the more we have this communion with a our, with our close friend. And then it takes us to a place where we start to think like him. And can two walk together lest they be agreed? So the whole issue is that God wants us to be, come to a point where mentally we agree with him. You know? And that is why my favorite description of what it means to have the seal of God is as Ellen White puts it. It is a settling into the truth spiritually and intellectually so that we cannot be moved. And you know why we cannot be moved? Because God's position becomes our position. And it's not like we are just a part of a church. So I'm going to do what the church says. You are convicted in the recesses of your soul that what God says is right. You agree with it because you see the practicality, the pragmatic nature of what he says. And you know in your soul that it is right. Not because God just said do this. From the standpoint of principle, you have an acute understanding that what God is requiring of you is fair, right, and just. I guess when that becomes your conviction, you cannot move. You are willing to die for something like that. And that is what God wants us to do, to get to the point where we agree with him wholeheartedly. So prayer really doesn't change God's mind. You know, God is too transcendent in terms of what time is and, and change. Change, change, change is, is something... It, it, it's something that 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 alters as 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 as, as things go go along, you know. But God is everlasting, so so He cannot change. And He says it: "I'm the Lord, I God, I change not." So not even His mind can be changed. So the, the purpose of prayer is really for us to come up to to a higher standard and to to meet God where He is at. Mm, but, to but, bring but, but, but God's mind isn't changed. Our prayers can never change His mind. Amen. You know? It is, it is to basically bring us to a place where we understand him better and better. And, and it really is geared towards changing our mind. You know, so, so I hope that helps Sister Diane. Can I add something to that, was it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, and uh, you rightly quoted Malachi 3 verse 6. I am the Lord, I do not change. God does not have a plan B. God only needs a plan A. Amen. If God allowed himself to be changed by our prayers or our submission, then he would cease to be God. Amen. What, it would mean, what it would mean is that he did something that was imperfect. Yep. But we know that whatever God does, it is perfect. Amen. Um, Isaiah 55 verse 11, God says, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty or void, but it will accomplish what I please and prosper in the thing for which I sent it. God is saying, when I do something, it will go forth. Amen. And, and even this matter of sin, it is only a pause because God's original intention will come through amen and so when i when i consider it just to full circle my sister if god is truly omniscient it means that he knows everything so he's not caught by surprise but some persons have a difficulty in differentiating a conditional prophecy versus a prophecy given by divine decree there are times when god will give a prophecy but it is based on the conditions or the decisions of the target audience. Yeah. Like when Jonah was supposed to go to Nineveh, the prophecy was conditional on how they would respond. But little did Jonah know that God was also preparing him. So when God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and he stopped at Abraham, and Abraham started to say, if you find 40, will you destroy the city? If you find 30, if you find 20, was Abraham changing God's mind? Nope. No, God was giving Abraham the opportunity to exercise his faith. The same with Pharaoh. Every time the word went to Pharaoh, 
God presented the situation to allow Pharaoh to choose a side. Unfortunately, he grieved away the Holy Spirit and his heart was hardened. And every day we have the same opportunity. God puts us in positions where we need to choose. And he desires of us to choose him. But this has nothing to do with his divine decree. When God lays down a thought, it needs no adjustment. There are times when he allows things to unfold so that others can see the evidence as it comes from our lives because only God can read the heart. Amen. And so that's how I would respond to that. Yep. Amen. Amen. Um, Brother Hines, I see your hand. Thank you for that, Mikey. Yes, indeed. Um, I really thank um, Brother Mikey and, and, and uh, Azar for that answer. That is indeed true. Um, I would like to know, though, what's his perspective? What is his perspective on God's reasoning for, you know, telling King Hezekiah to, you know, get up in from and, and, and prepare, you know, prepare him also for, for his time of death and what have you? Because indeed, him, um, when he got his life extended, he went and, you know, and get a wrong bang for allowing the Babylonians um, to come in and showing him all the riches instead of showing him um, Jesus Christ or um, Jehovah. And, and but then when I really think about it, I, I, in the, is, was it not a wrong bang to that the submit to the will of the Lord and not bother ask for extra life or so? Well, um, the thing is, you know, again, you know, God's mind transcends ours, you know. Would God not have known that Ezekiah would have asked for what he asked for? Um, he encourages us in the in the in the parable of the importing it. Would you without to, to, to just keep making our petitions known to God? You know, because when we ask for God to intervene in he always answers. Whether it is yes, no, or are we it? But he always answers. Um I I would not pretend that I know exactly why God extended time for King Hezekiah because only God's mind is is so beyond the reach of my God's mind is the is the only mind of of its of its kind so only God would understand to the greatest extent why he did that what we can do is glean lessons you know we have an we have an, an record in the scriptures somebody who God extended time for because God requested it. And the lesson that I learned from the life of King Hezekiah is that once you get extended time, it must be rightly used. So when I look at those things, I just learn lessons from them, you know, because God never revealed the why behind it, you know. So the things that are hidden are not for me, you know, but the things revealed are for my myself and, and, and my children after me. So, 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 in that case, what I do know we, we, that is revealed is that Hezekiah never utilized his second chance properly. You know, um, when God turned back the sun in its degrees, the, 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 the heliocentric worshippers of Babylon saw the sun go back and they realized that there is another person in charge of their God that they are worshipping. So this God is the one true God. And it and then the the, the, the the information came to the Babylonians that it is the God Jehovah of the Hebrews that turned the sun back in its degrees. So these people actually sought Hezekiah for an audience to know more about God. And he got distracted about assets that he had, and he used it as an opportunity to boast in himself. I just gleaned the lesson from that. That throughout the course of our lives, God will do extraordinary things for us. And when he does these extraordinary things, it is an opportunity to glorify God. It is not to draw attention to ourselves or to vaunt ourselves or to make a display of ourselves. Because when we do that, the results will be proven tragic, just like in the case of Hezekiah. So to be honest, I don't know why God did that you know but 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 what i do learn from it is that when god steps into your scenario and and, and works mightily to the point where attention is drawn to you 
based on what happened, whatever it is, whatever miracle God will work out, and it, and it draws attention to you. That attention that you are afforded is not for you to glorify yourself. The attention afforded is for you to use it as an opportunity to witness and to draw men's minds to the great I am. So, to be honest with you, brother, that is the only answer I can give. I, I don't know why God extended the time. Uh, that, but I have learned a lesson from Hezekiah. And, and the sad thing is, you know, that, that the, there were many negative results from that extended time. You know, Hezekiah should have even really maintained this or setting his house in harder. In that extra 15 years, Hezekiah gave birth and right. Well, he never birthed the child, but, you know, he was part of the process of um, creating Manasseh. And Manasseh was one of the most evil kings in the history of Israel. Manasseh was actually responsible for sawing Isaiah in half. So if Ezekiah never lived that extra 15 years, there would be no Manasseh sawing Isaiah in half. You know? So again, that's another lesson to be learned. that When God gave extended time or a chance, improve upon your life. Don't waste it. Don't, don't, don't participate in foolish things. You know, because you might set things in order where it would have been better if you were dead. And none of us want that kind of a record, you know? And I think God allowed this to be on record in the scriptures for us to learn that time is a precious thing and it must be used wisely to the best of our ability. So that is my takeaway from it. In terms of what God was thinking, that remains a mystery to me. But I know that God always has a wise purpose behind anything which he allows or permits or, or does by direct volition. So I hope that help, um, Brian. Yeah, man, definitely. And, and what, what I just made me realize a lot of it is that the same thing, in essence, you know, the same thing we all do as um, Seventh-day Adventists, the same thing I'm doing, because we have this extra committed time when the shape of Popman in 1888, and you know, I have a lot of extra time afforded and to us to, um, to practice right, um, righteousness by faith and to establish all these different things that we need to be doing, publishing houses, um, restaurants, health restaurants, industries, um, uh, sanitariums, sanitariums, not hospitals, and all these other things yet still. Um, really missing out and I remember the conversation that you and I had in regards that you know to be using our talents to the, 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 the best of, 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 of possibilities that we have um, and you know there's a lot of things missing, lacking that we should be doing to be able to point God point people towards that and we, we, we it kind of look like a kind, a kind of repeating Hezekiah in a sense. Amen. You know, something I, I'm glad the brother brought it up because it's something that's always troubled me about the life of Hezekiah. And it, in terms of Proverbs 13, verse 22, that says, A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. And I, it, 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 what Hezekiah said when the prophet came to him and said, what have you done? Don't you see that all the things that you showed these people, they're going to come back for it at such time. And Hezekiah's response is, I'm going to die anyway. That's going to be the, gener the next generation's problem. And I, I was really so taken aback by his response. I said, how could he have said that? You know, how could he have said something like that? You know, like it just, it really troubled me. It really troubled me when you think, uh, when I look back on the, his record that this was the man who, when um, the kings, the, 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 was it, I don't remember which nation it was, but 18,000 soldiers came against um, Israel. And he spread out the matter before God and um, put God put you know and God intervened and sent angels to kill those their enemies and stuff. This was the man who exercised faith 
and then you know he went and said something like that. It just, it just, I don't know. It, it's, it's troubling. I don't know if anybody has any perspective, perspectives on it. Um, anybody have a, a um a perspective? Mm, that is true. We should always leave the world. Um, do our best by God's grace to leave the world better than, than, than how you came into it, how we found it. Only, you see, have to take the example from Christ's life. Anytime we move to a, a town or a city or whatever, whatever you, um, there was no moment of sickness or anything of that form. Um, people were pointed onto the way of righteousness and such forth. Um, he did every, anything that he did, he did it well. Um, <laughs> as far, I not sure the full significance of it, but in God's far as when he was um the fall of him, grave, grave attire, graveyard attire, and, and and put it down. So they can have a have a willing to, um mindset to 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 things. Have to be good stewards in everything. You have to take the time practice from a few little things. If you know, especially if you're coming from a bad place. You know, we'll take the time, practice a few little things, and we we'll start to increase uh, overall all uh, different matters or things that God has placed us over to be good mm-hmm. steward of everything till we're, we're just living and breathing good stewardship. So that would be a, a bad practice of stewardship on Ezekiel's part. But we have to look now. We, now we have to look inwards and and say, oh, what am I not doing well on? What am I not capitalizing on? What am I not taking good care of? You know, I have a vehicle, am I treating it well in terms of, you know, not overspending or over cleaning it every time or such for, but making sure that all the parts are functioning and such for, because it's God give you the ability to add, to add on it and make it, you're going to you need to make good use of it. You know, you see, you can pick up some, bring it into the church or you can carry over some food in to, to feed people, all sorts of different stuff like that. And that's just one example. Uh-huh. What what came to my mind as you were talking was the story was you know the how Peter was in one moment he spoke under the unction of the Holy Spirit and Jesus um, commended him when he said that you know only the only the you know only God could have shown me this that he's the Christ but then when Jesus started to tell him that he was going to die. Peter said, "Far be it from you, Lord." And Jesus had to rebuke the the, the 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 evil spirit that was was whispering in his ear, saying saying that to him. So I was just thinking that you know we have to really be watchful unto prayer because you know not because we are sanctified at one point in our lives don't mean that um, we can give up the fight at the end of the road. That is so true. You have to practice mm-hmm. that prayer, that prayer without that without um the aim being at the end because we're always supposed to be in prayer. We are practicing the presence of God, and that is it. Seems like even for me, you know, it always seems like a fairly difficult concept to to, to to materialize. But I know by God's grace, yeah, His grace and His grace are gonna reach here, and I do pray that for everybody to always you know understand that as God is on the present. His, uh, his eyes, his presence, his eyes are own. So we will not be concerned with this in front of the King of the world. So, you know, keep that in mind, be cognizant of that. You know, um, um, in closing, as I think about King Hezekiah, God gave him an opportunity to really display to the world the kind of God that he worshipped. You know, these people were not in connection with the one true God. They worship objects made by their own hands because they were ignorant of who God really is. And God allowed for knowledge to arrive to the Babylonians that the person who turned the sun back in its degrees is the God of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah should have been focusing 
and the opportunity that God gave him to show forth his glory. But his mind was on things of a lower nature. And he lost out on the opportunity. Raised a very destructive youngster as a result. Um, blighted Israel, you know, because his focus was wrong. It was like an ongoing chain reaction. Cast the life of a prophet. You know, the man's neglect to do that which was right. Was not something to just brush under the carpet, you know. It had long lasting effects, you know. His refusal to do that which is good, you know. And sometimes we talk about the sin of omission. And sometimes we don't realize the power involved in the sin of omission. Just to neglect to do something which is right, you can say adverse circumstances into motion just like how oh, Ezekiah just not really setting his house in order created circumstances for a man say a man who saw the prophet in half you know because he neglected to do that which is right you know sometimes we don't learn Ellen White says that the best thing we can give our children is to learn what it means to reason from cause and effect and I realize it is a missing thing amongst Christians. It's that like people just go to church, but they don't learn to reason from cause to effect. They don't learn to add, add, um, look at life from a standpoint and try to understand from the standpoint of reason. Why is God asking me to refrain from doing this? Because you know, if you actually allow yourself to reason from cause to effect and you are honest, God will show you, you know. God actually allow you to understand, you know, and you say, oh, you know, God is really wise in giving instructions that I ought not to do this. Because when I do opposite of what he says, it creates adverse circumstances and it will affect not only me, it will affect other generations down the road. Because that man's neglect to, to minister to the Babylonians actually caused Babylon to lay siege on Jerusalem and it caused the life of hundreds of thousands of people. I would like to talk about Daniel and his fellows. You know, Daniel and his fellows were eunuchs. They understand what that means? They're, 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 they're either when Daniel was called to work in the court, you know, because people like to use Daniel as, a, um, as an example that you should run for political office. And we, should, and we always say, oh, but Daniel and Joseph were people involved in politics but both daniel and joseph were actual slaves they never ran a campaign to be a prime minister they were slaves so god used that scenario in spite of that was not an ideal circumstance and what even made daniel's situation far less than ideal is that he was a eunuch which means there is a high probability that there were two options when you were a eunuch Either your penis was removed, if you're a male, your penis was either removed or you were castrated, meaning they did something to, to, to adjust your testicles so that you can't reproduce. And, and, and the thing is, they created eunuchs to protect the integrity of the queen. So she never, because eunuchs served closely to the royal court and they had access to the queen. And I believe that it is the likelihood that his penis was removed. So, so anybody would want to vote for their penis to be removed or to run for office that causes your penis to be severed from your body? No. So, so we shouldn't use these examples because when you look at the original historic context, they would not have been campaigning for that office. God used them in that office in spite of, of, of his ID. That was less than ID. Daniel working for the court of Babylon was less than an ideal situation. So poor Daniel lost his, his reproductive um, functions because of Hezekiah. The temple was destroyed because of Hezekiah. All Israel suffered because of Hezekiah. They became slaves because of Hezekiah. Daniel was thrown in a furnace. And, 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 and Well, his friends were thrown in the furnace. But Daniel was thrown in a lion's den live through, through, through generational slavery because of Hezekiah. The people were taken in, in, in captive and slavery because of Hezekiah. Because he never used the opportunity to give God glory. You know, as we, as we, as we look at 
God might not have turned the sun back in its degrees for the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but God has invested so much in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So many precious counsels that would, that if obeyed as the prophet of the Lord said, would make us men to marvel. You know, our pioneers were simple people, like real wood workers and, and, and tradesmen and steamboat captains and farmers. No, no, none of them were, 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 were really great lettered men of the world. Majority of them were just normal people. And when you look at what they did, the profound achievements that, that are attached to their name, the most published female author in the history of the entire world, as long as this earth has existed, this record has not been broken. The most published female author in the history of this earth is a Seventh-day Adventist little woman with a third grade level education. And yet she has written over 200 books and periodicals and pamphlets. Over 200. Over 200. And brethren, we believe that God is going to close up his work with less effort than he began the Seventh-day Adventist work. You know, brethren, we really have, have fallen from, 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 from the state of Philadelphia where there, were genuine, there, there was genuine love towards God. And, and brotherly love, you know, we really have lost sight of what we are about. And it is sad. But God has not given up on Seventh day Adventism. And, and I believe God is looking for a generation that, 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 that is ambitious towards God. This is not about getting a name for yourself. Ellen White never wanted a name for herself. She just wanted to serve God as best as she could. And this little lady with a third grade level education wrote over 200 books. I have so many lettered people now in the church and they produce far less than Ellen White. Because they are full of them themselves and they have so little of Christ inside of them. So their lives produce very little. And it starts as, as an indictment. Can you imagine these, these simple folk? They, they, they never call themselves doctor so and so and doctor this and doctor this and that. And we have so many doctors, doctors of theology, doctors of business, doctor of medicine. We have so many doctors and we produce so little with our lives. So little, yet so many doctors. And a woman with a third grade level education who just love the Lord produce 200, over 200 books and periodicals and pamphlets. The most published female author in the entire history of the world. I think what we need more these days is, 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 is more love for God. And I think that is what Laodicea lacks in. And that's why God says that you, you, you believe you are rich and increased with goods, man. But, but you're poor. You're poor, man. You lack something. You're weak and emaciated, man. You're blind. And you're wretched and naked because you have too much confidence in yourself. You have too much confidence in yourself. And you produce so little. But genuine love for God. You know, a young man, Jana Avikelag, became one of our leading medical professionals. Unfortunately, he lost his way, but when he was with God and, 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 and following God's path, that man was a leader in the area of medicine and created an industry which right now is estimated at over $40 billion in value. There will be no breakfast cereal industry if the Seventh-day Adventist church never existed. A multi-billion dollar industry owes its entire existence to the fact that there are Seventh-day Adventists. You know? A multi-billion dollar industry. But those billions have gone from God's coffers and it is out there in the world because even Kellogg's conflicts that was started by the Kellogg family does not belong to the Seventh-day Adventist movement anymore. The people who run it are not Seventh-day Adventists because they lost sight of focusing and giving God glory. Even the two brothers who initially started the conflicts were ended up quarreling over money and patent rights because they lost sight of giving God glory and became focused on giving glory to themselves. And brethren, we have some lessons to learn from Ezekiah. God has risen up, us up to do a great work 
And it is a comprehensive work. The Seventh day Adventist Church was raised up to do more than just preach. You know, we were raised up to find and establish industries to teach people how to prepare nutritious food and how to have a balanced diet. The Seventh day Adventist work is a partial health work as well. The Seventh day Adventist work has inside of it the gospel mandate at its forefront, but it is a comprehensive work. It's not a one-sided work. Part of our work is educating our children and the children of those who are not Seventh-day Adventists. But we have lost sight of the comprehensive work and we have lessened the nature of the work. But brethren, when God turns the sun back in its degrees, it's an opportunity to do something amazing. And God has all the Babylonians looking at us. He has done some amazing things through the pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Virgin, it is in our hands now. Do not take the Babylonians and show them, oh, this is, this is, this is how our buildings look and this is how our infrastructure is. This is how NCU looks and this is our TV station. No. When God turns the sun back in its degrees, let the focus be, how can I best honor God with the life and the time that he has given me? Because time is precious and fleeting, brethren. And if we are living our lives for ourselves and, and, and the honor of God is not at the forefront of our minds, we might as well just go and live our regular life. Just, just live like one of the people who don't even know God. Because if you are going to live for yourself, you are going to lose out on heaven anyway. So, you know, stop polishing your shoes Thursday and or Wednesday and, and ironing your clothes early in the week. If you are going to live for yourself, might as well just do it all the way out because you are still going to lose out on eternity. But Virgin, if we are going to be Christians, man, let us live for the glory and honor of God primarily and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Let us have a vision for the cause of God and the welfare of our fellow human beings. Because then, Virgin, when we are living from that standard, we are truly keeping the commandments of God and having the faith of Jesus. Virgin, God has given us a grand opportunity called life. And I recommend that we use it wisely. God bless. And i see you tomorrow afternoon. You know, um, have a wonderful Sabbath wherever you are in this world. Have a wonderful Sabbath. And, and, and you know, talk to God. Talk to God. You know, ask him, God, what is my purpose? How can I, what can I do to, to enhance your kingdom? What was I made for? Really talk to him. Really agonize with him because you were made for something, you know. All of us have a special work that, that we, are, we, are, we are made for. And, and I think it is time we start asking God what that thing is and start fulfilling it. So, so whenever, if God chooses to, 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 to put you to sleep and resurrect you, or, or God translates you without seeing death. Like mommy? Yeah, mommy, mommy was put to sleep and she's going to resurrect one day. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Bye, Uncle Chris. Bye, Auntie Shawnee. <laughs> Tell Susie and Sally that I said hi. <laughs> All right. So, 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 brethren, have a good night and God bless. Let us pray. Righteous. Daddy, hmm? Daddy can I pray, please? All right. You pray first, Mommy. Righteous Heavenly Father, thank you for Mommy, Daddy, and me. And thank you for Grandma, Devin, and Tony. And and all the people around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Righteous Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for your loving kindness and your tender mercies. And we ask that you will help us to overcome. Please be with us, Lord, as we journey through this life. Give us strength and, and wisdom. Help us, God, to 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 draw closer to you help us to agree with you like enoch because two cannot walk together lest they be agreed and you walked with enoch and you translated it lord we are preparing for either resurrection or translation but you are just coming back for people who agree with you lord so i pray that you will bring me into agreement with you settle my mind intellectually and spiritually so can, i can never be moved from the truth and I pray this prayer for everyone on this study. In Christ's name we pray.
Amen. And amen. amen. For the foremost, and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our Christian and our Amen. Thanks much, Taraji. All right, good, good night, everybody. Bye. Have a great night. Good night. Thank you. Good night, Good night, everybody. Good night, Good night Uncle Chris. God bless. Have a great, great night. Bye. Good night, Taraji. Good night, Taraji. Good night, Brother Wazar. Good night, family. Bye. Good night, Good night. Good night, Wazar. Good night. Good night, Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night.